Welcome to our live webinar titled New and Emerging Therapies for MDS. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lee Clark, patient educator, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I'd like to recognize the generous support of Bristol Myers Squibb, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Agios, Genentech, and Takeda Oncology, and the generous support of our patients, families, and caregivers for supporting the webinar program today. Due to the high volume of teleconferences on the internet, it is possible you may lose your connection during the program. If you are unable to view the webinar online, you can call in to hear the audio portion of the program using the call-in number in your reminder email. Today's program will be archived to our website within two to three business days. You will be notified by email when it is live and ready for viewing. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. To submit a question or comment, open the Q&A window in the lower part of your screen. Just type your question or comment in the small text box window, and when you have finished typing, just hit enter. We will do our best to get to all questions today. When asking questions, I do ask that you do two things to help me manage the incoming questions. First, submit your entire question all at the same time. Second, please do not share private health information in your question. Our speakers cannot answer any specific questions related to your personal health care. Today's specialists are Dr. Ramir Zaiden and Dr. Amit Verma. Dr. Zaiden is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Department of Internal Medicine Section of Hematology at Yale Cancer Center. Dr. Verma is a Professor in the Departments of Medicine, Oncology, and the Department of Developmental and Molecular Biology at Albert Einstein School of Medicine. He is also the Director of the MDS program. With that said, I'd like to welcome Dr. Zaiden and Dr. Verma. Thank you for joining us today. And Dr. Zaiden will start. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'm going to be mostly focusing, given the constraints of, of time here, about uh, the general presentation of MDS and talk about one of the recently approved drugs uh, Encovi, and then Dr. Verma will go into the other approved drug, uh, Los Patercet, and we'll try to keep most of the um, time, I think, for questions and interactive uh, discussion rather than the slides. So um, next slide here. So these are my uh, disclosures. Relevant to this is that I have consulted uh, to uh, Taiho and Otsuka, the company that manufactures uh, Encovi as well as uh, Celgene and PMS for Los Patercet. Next slide. So MDS, uh, many of you might be familiar with, uh, with myelodysplastic syndromes, but for those who are not basically, MDS is a number of actually closely related disorders. So it's not only one condition, one condition, sorry. So it's uh, all of these conditions are characterized by certain features, including bone marrow failure. Bone marrow failure means that the bone marrow is not uh, doing the function it's supposed to do. The same way the kidney or the liver or the heart could fail and stop doing what it's supposed to do, the bone marrow could stop doing that. And the bone marrow is the factory that makes the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. So when it stops working, those cells become low in numbers and they can lead to uh, complications such as infection risk, complications of anemia and symptoms of anemia, as well as risk of uh, bleeding. And that's related to the increased number of uh, early cells that are progenitors, which are dying within the bone marrow before they get released into the blood. MDS can progress into more aggressive forms of uh, bone marrow uh, conditions, such as acute myeloid leukemia. However, MDS by itself can cause a lot of problem related to the low blood counts. So myelodysplastic syndromes have, a, so have, although they are called anemia or pre-leukemia or um, syndromes, uh, 
uh, they actually have uh, can be associated with uh, with poor outcomes and i think this is important for people to know because sometimes there's a tendency to underestimate the severity of uh, myelodysplastic syndromes you can see here the five year survival and the five year survival associated with uh, uh, some forms of mds especially the more aggressive forms is actually as bad as you could see with other cancers uh, such as solid uh, tumors. And for that reason, I think it's very important for patients to ask their doctor and consider getting an expert opinion in a, uh, in a center where many patients are seen because those type of cancers uh, such as MDS are, are not common and rare. Next slide. So how is the diagnosis of MDS made? I think the most important uh, steps are to rule out other conditions because there are certain conditions that could mimic MDS. So uh, when you look at the blood counts or when you uh, evaluate the patients with the low blood counts, there could be other conditions that could do that, such as uh, certain medications, nutritional deficiencies, such as B12 or folate, other conditions, immune conditions. So that usually requires uh, sending some blood work and doing a bone marrow biopsy. You can see here in this figure how the bone marrow biopsy is done in which we uh, put a needle to get a sample from inside the bone, the bone marrow, usually in the low back. And then we run uh, certain studies, including uh, cytogenetics and molecular diagnostics to establish the diagnosis. So this is a complicated slide, but the idea is to show you here that there are a number of different systems that we use to try to classify MDS. So MDS, as I mentioned, could be significantly different between patients. Some patients have more aggressive forms that are almost like acute leukemias, and some patients have um, uh, less aggressive forms uh, that uh, are closer to anemias, and the patients can live with that for many years. And to try to capture that degree of um, heterogeneity, several uh, risk tools or stratification tools have been developed. You can see here some of the most commonly used ones such as the IPSS, which is the International Prognostic Scoring System, the revised version of that, the WHO and the MD Anderson Prognostic Scoring Systems. You can see with each one, certain variables such as the number of the plasts, the bad cells in the bone marrow, the cytogenetics, which are the chromosomal changes that we see, and then the severity and the blood counts abnormalities and whether the patient is transfusion dependent. So for all, each of those variables, we um, log in the value and then add them together. And then we end up with a risk group. And the patients are, I think very importantly, they should ask their doctor and figure out where do they fall in, in, at least on some of those prognostic scoring systems. So it's not sufficient to know that you only have MDS, but you should know whether it's low, intermediate one, intermediate two or high, for example, because that affects the management as well as the counseling in terms of expected survival. Next slide. Another complex slide, but this tells you basically uh, that in addition to the uh, disease factors that I just mentioned to you, there are a number of other emerging factors that are important in classifying MDS. The most important ones are molecular alterations, and those have not yet been formally introduced into the, those risk stratification tools. But now we have increased understanding that some of those are very important, not only to understand the disease severity, but also for emerging therapeutics. For example, TP53 mutation is an alteration that happens in five to 10% of patients and is generally associated with worse outcomes. On the other hand, IDH mutations, isocitrate dehydrogenase can occur in five to 10% of patients. And those are being targeted and have approved therapies in acute myeloid leukemia. And they are being studied also in MDS and they are actually being used sometimes of label in cases of um, refractory cases of MDS where the patient has those mutations, the IDH1 and IDH2. So I think it's important also to inquire from your doctor what molecular alterations do you have. Another important alteration, and Dr. Verma will talk more about this, is the presence of the SF3P1 uh, splicing alteration. And this one is associated with um, the therapy he's going to talk about uh, in terms of chance of response, uh, Los Patterson. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So mutations, basically, when we talk about mutations, people tend to think about uh, genetic alterations that are inherited. However, there are two main different types of uh, mutations or genetic alterations. So you have germline, and those are basically uh, alterations in the DNA that you are born with or inherited from the parents. However, in MDS, the mutations that we typically see are called somatic mutations, and those are acquired. So basically, they occur overnight uh, related to environmental conditions or um, toxic exposures, or sometimes just to advanced age. And those, the accumulation of these are generally what leads to cancers, including myelodysplastic syndromes. Next slide. Those are examples of some of those mutations. You can see here they are arranged according to the specific biological pathway that's disrupted. And the size of each circle represents the frequency by which we see those mutations. So you can see, for example, T2, DNMT3A, and ACXL1 are among the more common alterations, and they affect um, uh, an important biological process called epigenetic uh, regulation. Also splicing factor alterations, we just mentioned the SF3B1, and also the TP53, you can see right that on the right top corner. So all of those are important in the pathogenesis and the development and progression of myelodysplastic syndromes. Next slide. However, the problem compared to conditions such as chronic myeloid leukemia in which every single patient will have the same alteration which is called translocation of chromosome 9 and 22 or bcr able translocation. MDS, on the other hand, we have many mutations as we just showed you. However, most patients will have only uh, two or three of those and most patients will have um, alterations that are not shared by other patients. So only five or six of those mutations are seen in more than 10% of patients, which adds to the, uh, a diversity and the different presentation of patients and the different outcomes as well as the different therapies you can give. And this is, I think, part of the challenge of why it took a long time for us to find new therapies that are effective for MDS, because there's a lot of variation in the biology and the genetic uh, development of the condition. Next slide. So how about treatments? Uh, treatments basically uh, are available for MDS. However, the only way to cure MDS in general is allogenic bone marrow transplantation. This is an uh, aggressive uh, procedure. Generally, the patient has to be in uh, good health. Generally, the patient has to be fit. And while we are doing it in some older patients, generally the best candidates are the younger patients. Depending on the institution, most places will not do a bone marrow transplantation for patients who are older than somewhere between 70 to 75, except in rare situations. So for the vast majority of patients, around 90 to 95% of patients, the goal of the treatment is uh, basically to try to focus on prolonging survival, minimizing complications uh, such as infections, reducing the hospitalization, and to try to improve the quality of life. In patients who have the more aggressive forms of MDS, we also try to prolong survival using a group of agents called hypomethylating agents. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit more on the higher risk MDS, the more aggressive forms of MDS. And Dr. Verma will talk about uh, the lower risk MDS, including the drug loss patterson. So the diagnosis, as we mentioned, basically, once it's established, basically, if the patient is a candidate for a bone marrow transplant, this is where we try to go with the treatment. Uh, the only group of drugs that are approved for higher risk myelodysplastic syndromes are agents called hypomethylating agents. Uh, and those include two drugs. Both of them are given by injection, azacitidine or decitabine. Most recently, oral versions of both of those uh, agents have been approved. However, only an oral version of this itibine has been approved for MDS, which is the drug that's called Incovi. An oral version of azacitidine has been approved also in, in early September in the US just a few weeks ago. However, it has been approved for older patients who have uh, acute myeloid leukemia in the maintenance setting and not for MDS. Next slide. 
So what's the problem with those injectables? The problem is that the patient has to come frequently to the office. Uh, you have to have an, uh, a line uh, so that the drug can be given intravenously for the cytidine or azacitidine. Azacitidine can be given subcutaneously under the skin. However, this is associated, of course, with uh, you know, some pain or discomfort for some patients, or you have to leave a device which could be um, putting the patient at risk of infections. The other problem is that these drugs are generally given for five to seven days in a row, each 28 days, each one month, the patient has to come five to seven days in a row to get the uh, injectable version of these drugs. So I think the introduction of oral versions have been uh, an area of interest for many years and several attempts have been tried until most recently when we had positive results from this phase three trial that was just presented in the American Society of Meeting uh, of Hematology meeting last December, uh, the ascertain study, which uh, examined an oral version of the cytobine uh, compared to the intravenous version. And they were shown to have similar pharmacokinetics, meaning that their levels in the blood are similar. And based on this uh, study, the FDA have approved Incovi or the oral version of the cytobine. And I'm going to show you some of the clinical results from this study. Next slide, please. So this uh, compound, which used to be called Aztec 727, is a combination of two drugs, the cytobine, which is a hypomethylating agent, combined with an agent called cidazoridin. So uh, the problem, why can't you take the cytobine orally? We mentioned that it's given by injection. The problem is that we have enzymes, basically, within our gut and within our liver that break down the cytobine. These are enzymes that are uh, present in the body basically to protect us against toxins. And, and part of their function is to destroy many medications, including the cytobine. So this is why it doesn't work to try to take the drug by mouth. Cidazoridin basically inhibits the enzyme that is called cytidine deaminase. This is the enzyme that specifically destroys or breaks down the cytobine. So combining both of those drugs in one tablet allows the cytobine to be absorbed in the body without being destroyed in the gut or in the liver. And that basically uh, what leads to its activity. So it's not really a new drug. It's more a repurposing of the intravenous the cytobine so that it can be given orally. And early phase studies have been done with different doses of those agents to try to figure out what's the dose that's equivalent to the intravenous dose that we give to our patients. And after a number of studies, it has been determined that cidazoridin at 100 milligram and the cytobine at 35 milligram is equivalent to the dose that we give by injection. This is a flat dose, meaning that it does not change by weight, while the injectable version, 20 milligram per meter square, depends on the patient weight and height on what we call the body surface area. Next slide. So this is, uh, you can see here the design of the study. This was an interesting design because patients were randomized in one-to-one -one fashion to receive the oral version or the IV version. And in the second cycle, they flipped. So if you started with IV, you got oral, or if you started with oral, you got IV. And then starting with the third cycle, everybody got the oral version. And uh, the idea of the study is that the patients were compared in terms of their intravenous and oral exposure to establish equivalence in the pharmacokinetics or the level of the drug in, in the body. Next slide. And this is the top line results uh, uh, in terms of this study. What you can see here is that the area under the curve, which is a measurement of the drug in, in the system in, in, the, in the plasma, uh, were 99% similar. So effectively, whether you are giving the drug by intravenous route or oral route, uh, the exposure in the body appears to be similar, indicating that you can use the oral version instead of the intravenous version. Next slide. And some of the clinical results, this is study has just been presented. So there is ongoing follow-up and I think we'll understand more about the clinical activity. However, from the earlier results, it seems that the uh, responses are somewhat along the lines of what we see with the intravenous version. Here you can see the com complete response rate, which is 
uh, around 12%. However, we have to remember that this study was ongoing. So some patients did not yet get the several cycles that we often need to do to see responses. Some patients need to four to six cycles, four to six months before we see uh, responses. So those numbers are expected uh, to, you know, to change over uh, subsequent presentations that will be updated from this uh, trial. Next slide. So I think in COVID, basically, based on this data, have been approved by the FDA. It has been approved for patients who have intermediate one, intermediate two, or high risk MDS, which is the same indication as the intravenous decitabine. It has been approved for both untreated as well as uh, previously treated patients and those with de novo or secondary MDS. Um, so this is a drug I think that uh, will be a, a good option for many patients because it re can reduce the visits, the frequency of visits uh, that are needed to administer the drug. But I think another important consideration is that this oral drug could be a platform for combination with many other agents. We are currently in an era that is similar to what we are seeing with uh, acute myeloid leukemia in which many drugs are being given in combination. This is a busy slide, but I wanted just to give you uh, a kind of a brief summary of all these other agents that are being tested. You can see here several agents uh, such as venetoclast, APR246, pivonidistat, the anti-TIM3 MPG, um, and all of those agents are in advanced clinical testing and also the anti-CD47. This is an immuno, immune uh, checkpoint type of therapy against the macrophages. All of those drugs are in advanced phase two or phase three trials. So we are anticipating that a lot of uh, changes are gonna happen over the next few years. And what you can see to the right is that uh, we are trying to also apply the idea of personalized medicine or uh, giving patients therapy options that are dependent on their specific genetic alterations. And this is something we do all the time in AML, but we are starting to do it also in MDS. So I do think that the future is bright for patients with MDS. I think we are gonna have a lot of novel options and hopefully move into the direction of oral therapies instead of intravenous therapies. But ultimately, I think clinical trial participation, I encourage all of you uh, the patients uh, to consider going to clinical trials because we always want to improve the outcomes further. And the only way to do that is by getting patients into clinical trials that looks at novel and improved therapies. And these are my acknowledgements. I like to thank everybody who has helped in, in, in my research efforts as well as all of our patients and their families. And I'm happy to take any questions after uh, Dr. Verma's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amr. This was fantastic uh, summary of MDS and the new oral drug that's approved. Uh, I wanted to briefly introduce you to another new drug, Lospatercept, that's been recently approved by the FDA this year. These are my disclosures. Uh, next slide. And I just wanted to give you a little introduction on what this drug does and what pathways does it work on in MDS and how does it increase red blood cells. Next slide. Yes, yeah, so uh, as Amr mentioned, as and uh, a lot of you who are patients have experienced uh, low hemoglobin uh, anemia is probably the biggest problem that we face as MDS uh, clinicians and MDS patients. 70% of the patients who present with MDS actually are low or intermediate risk. And the main issues are low blood counts. Anemia is the commonest blood count to be low. And we really need uh, you know, new drugs that can increase hemoglobin, and so you have less need for blood transfusions, which, which are a big uh, you know, source of discomfort, as well as leading to problems such as iron overload. And in this graph, you, know, the, you can see the survival uh, is low in patients with low-risk MDS also. Primarily, a lot of this is driven by 
the low blood counts, the need for transfusions, iron overload and problems like that. So if you can increase blood counts, we can solve some of these issues. Next slide. So what does this drug do? You know, it, it, it blocks uh, our very important pathway called the TGF beta pathway. So what is TGF beta? It's a protein, the big name is transforming growth factor beta. And this is, a, this is a family of proteins, which includes a lot of family members. And this is a complicated slide. I just put it in there for, for people in the audience who want to uh, you know, learn the technical aspects of this pathway. But the point to remember is that there are certain harmful substances like TGF beta A that can stop the stem cells in the bone marrow from becoming red cells. So when you have an excess of these substances, you make less red cells. And there is this protein called SMAD, SMAD2 and 3 proteins that are the culprit. You know, when these proteins go up, because of these TGF beta family members, you get less red cell development. Next slide. Many years ago, we had shown that when you look at MDS bone marrow, so these are slides, that's how a bone marrow looks like. Uh, you have these white blank spaces, which are actually uh, fat molecules, but then you have these brown dots. These are the cells in the bone marrow. And the, we have stained them for this SMAD2 protein, the harmful protein. And you can see a lot more brown in the MDS versus the controls. So this, there's a lot of activated SMAD2 protein sitting in MDS. Next slide, please. When you use a mouse model, so you, you take a mouse and you make the mouse overproduce this TGF beta protein, the mouse actually becomes anemic. In the lower panel, you can see hemoglobin and hematocrit, two numbers a lot of our MDS patients are familiar with. They become less in the black bar, which is the TGF overproducing mouse. They also make less number of platelets. Next slide. And for, for those of you who, who are really interested in why this MAD2 protein is so high, we, we, we looked at hundreds of cases and we found that there is this natural endogenous you know, inhibitor called SMAD7. Next slide, please. Uh, if you press the button, yes. So there is this protein called SMAD7. Actually, if you go to the next slide, I'll show you that. So SMAD7, the job of SMAD7 is to prevent the TGF signaling, TGF activation from going out of control. But in MDS, for some reason, the SMAD7 is very low. Uh, next arrow. Next arrow. When this is low, the pathway starts firing on all cylinders and leads to low blood counts. Ne uh, next arrow. So how do you block this? So now that we know that this is a harmful pathway, causes anemia, we block this by designing drugs that block the activation of these harmful proteins. Next slide. And Luspatercept is one such uh, drug. This was, um, you know, this is a schematic which shows two very similar drugs, Luspatercept and Sotatercept. Uh, Luspatercept is the one that was approved for MDS. Both are actually quite similar and both have shown uh, efficacy or, or ability in raising blood counts. So the brown area, you know, which looks like a, a receptor is, is the part of the drug that binds these harmful TGF-like proteins. And the lower part, the blue part, is just part of an immunoglobulin, you know, a human immunoglobulin protein. And these drugs basically are called ligand traps. They're designer molecules that mop up the harmful proteins in the blood and allow the bone marrow to make red blood cells. Next slide. One of the harmful proteins in this TGF beta family is called GDF11. It's very technical stuff, but you know, just for people who are interested, we've shown that this GDF11 levels in the blood are very high. And when you take a stem cell from your bone marrow and expose it to GDF11, 
they make less red cells and the red cells look bigger in size. This is something we see all the time when we do a blood count on an MDS patient. Next slide. Okay, next slide, I'll skip this in the interest of time. Okay, so this schematic really shows you what's happening. In MDS, you have less number of red cells. That's what causes the anemia. And there is this block, there is a bottleneck in the later stages of formation of red cells. When you give a drug like losperacept, it mops up the negative signals, it mops up the harmful substances and relieves this bottleneck and you end up making more red cells. Next slide. So what's the clinical data look like? So the, these drugs were tested in two major studies. One was done in US, one was done in Europe. These were phase two studies, which looked good. And then uh, uh, they were tested in a phase three study. It's called the Medalist trial. Uh, Dr. Zaidan and uh, our center were also part of this. Uh, and uh, many, many centers in the US and internationally were part of this study. And in this study, if you go to the next slide. So this study included a clinical trial included patients with MDS who were adults and had this refractory uh, sideroblastic kind of MDS. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. Uh, for others, you know, when, when, when we do a bone marrow, you know, from your part of the hip bone, like Dr. Zaiden showed you, the, the pathologist looks at it under a microscope and there are these cells called ringed sideroblasts. They've got iron deposits arranged in a ring. If you have a bunch of these cells in the bone marrow, then you belong to this type of MDS called ringed sideroblastic MDS. Also, if you have this mutation in this protein called SF3B1, which is actually relatively common in MDS, uh, then you were eligible to go on this study. Patients in the study either got losperacept or they got placebo, and nobody knew who was getting what. You know, this was randomized, uh, a blinded study. Next slide, please. And this is the data. So most of the, you know, the patients were very anemic and they needed frequent blood transfusions. The things that I've highlighted in red color shows RBC transfusion independence, meaning you were, you were getting transfusions, but when you started this drug, you became RBC transfusion independent. Your hemoglobin rose above a certain level, like eight or nine, and you didn't need a transfusion. This was achieved in about 38% of patients who were getting losperacept versus 13% in the placebo. And this was a, quite a significant improvement by the drug. And this led to the, the FDA approving this drug. If we look broadly, more broadly, on how many patients got improvements on this drug, uh, we use another uh, metric, it's called hematological improvement, meaning, you know, the, your hemoglobin went up. You may not have been uh, completely independent of transfusions, but your hemoglobin did go up, and that was more like 50%. So, so in, in, in real world, in, you know, in general settings, if, if you ask your doctor about this drug, he'll say that patients who go on this drug derive benefit in about 40 to 50% of cases. Next slide. This is more updated data that's actually gonna be presented soon in uh, medical meetings. Same number, so 47% versus 15, 16% in the placebo. These are patients who achieved uh, independence from transfusions, didn't need transfusions for more than eight weeks, two months. And that's really the, the benefit that was seen in this drug. Uh, next slide. This just shows you hemoglobin. These are mean hemoglobins. You can see the line in blue is losperacept. The line in red is placebo. Hemoglobin went up, you know, two to three grams in the responders on this drug. And, and was able to, to hang around, you know, for, for a good period of time, as you'll see in the next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> 
Okay, so so I think I, that slide. So if you if you ask us, you know, how what is the duration of response? Uh, the the patients who got this drug benefited from this drug for for a median of you know a good period of time, and and the numbers from the trial show in excess of about uh, thirty weeks to more than two years in some cases. So this drug does have effects that can that can be uh, you know, for a good period of time. And this slide just shows you the label. This is the approved label um, with this drug. The trade name is called Reblozil. And uh, your hematologist, if, if he decides to start you on this, will start with one milligram per kg. It's given as an injection every three weeks. And we have the ability to increase the, the dose of this drug uh, by 30%. So it's starting one milligram per kg. Uh, your doctor can increase it to 1.33. If you still don't have a good response, can go up to a maximum of 1.75. And if there is no response seen, um, even after the higher dose, then I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, you don't respond to this and uh, the drug is discontinued. Um, so, so just to summarize, there are these certain harmful substances called TGF beta, GDF, SMAD proteins, which are overactivated in MDS. They can cause anemia. Luspatercept is has this ability to mop up or to trap these harmful substances and increase the late stages of red cell development. And it has been shown in this trial to decrease transfusion dependence in the refractory sideroblastic MDS or patients with the SF3B1 mutation. And, you know, obvious thing a patient will think about is, if I don't have this RARS, will this drug work for me? And this question is now being systematically tested in a clinical trial. You know, our experiences, and, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can ask Dr. Zaiden this also, that it does have you know, uh, anecdotally activity in other types of MDS is also. Uh, the, the other question is, can you combine it with other agents? We don't know that yet. I'm sure we'll know answers uh, when clinical trials are done. And how do we predict if a particular patient will respond to this or not? We don't know the answer to that yet, but there are studies underway. So I want to stop here and then, you know, both of us are happy to take any questions. Thank you both for the uh, wonderful presentations. We do have some questions. Uh, the first question is, will any of these therapies have an impact on platelet counts? Amir, you wanna go first? Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So hypomethylating agents um, such as the cytobine or isocytidine and also the oral version of the cytobine can lead to what we call trilineage responses. So complete response in general means that you have improvement in all of your counts. That includes the hemoglobin, the platelets, and the neutrophils. Uh, of course, as we mentioned, the presentation of MDS can be different between different patients. The most common problem is anemia, the low red blood cells. Los patercept is not expected necessarily to have a major impact on uh, platelets. Um, so we, I generally would not use it for someone whose main problem is low platelets. However, anecdotally and within the context of the trial, there has been a, a suggestion that some patients might have improvement in their neutrophils and platelets. It's something that we're still trying to understand and Dr. Verma probably can provide some, some perspective on that. But if the main problem is low platelets, um, generally what we typically use is a hypomethylating agent and that usually could be azacitidine or decitabine and oral decitabine in the context of MDS, uh, especially higher risk disease, could, should, could be substituted for the IV version. So I think if the main problem is low platelets, oral decitabine is definitely a, a reasonable option. There are a group of drugs that also are used in aplastic anemia, uh, such as romeplostim or eltrompobag. Those are drugs that activate specifically the platelets. There have been a concern in MDS that they could potentially increase the progression to the disease of the disease and might affect the PLAST count in an adverse way. Uh, 
So they are generally not approved in MDS. However, uh, there are increasing number of studies that in lower risk versions of MDS in which the main problem is low platelets, they could be used, especially in context of uh, the very older patients or in patients who are not candidates for transplants or potentially who did not respond to hypomethylating agents. But I would say the main drug to use for low for severe cases of uh, low platelets would be uh, a hypomethylating agent. Yeah, I you know that's a great answer. It's a particularly tough problem, actually, uh, the problem of low platelets, and uh, you know unfortunately the approved FDA approved agents we we only have a few of these. Among those, the hypomethylating agents probably have the best efficacy. Those patterns have only led to increase in a very few a minority of cases. We, we are running a trial with this, you know, l thrombopag in MDS. Unfortunately, it's not approved for the use in MDS, only aplastic anemia. Uh, our trial is very consistent uh, with the uh, results seen with other trials that it does have activity, but you can't get it, you know, outside of a clinical trial, it's not FDA approved. But, uh, you know, I hope we get some new agents down the road pretty soon. Thank you. Under what circumstances would a patient who is currently using either Videsa or Dacogen become a candidate for the new oral therapy in COVID? Under what circumstances would a patient uh, consider switching? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, I think if you look specifically at the FDA label approval, it actually um, mentions that it's approved for newly diagnosed or untreated patients, as well as previously treated. Um, many patients with MDS, for example, lower risk patients who progress to higher risk could have received uh, erythropoiesis stimulating agents or lenalidomide or some other agents. So it's not clear from the label whether previously treated patients, would that mean someone who is already on a hypomethylating agent intravenously and still responding or stopped responding. Um, I think that the label is, is somewhat um, meant to be wider in scope. So the way I interpret the label is that you could use it in someone who's already on a hypomethylating agent. I would probably not use it in someone who's stopped responding to a hypomethylating agent, but for someone who's on a hypomethylating agent, whether it's azacitidine and or decitabine, and they are responding, I think it's definitely a reasonable uh, consideration to, to switch the drug. I would not switch in the middle of a cycle. Um, so I would switch basically once a cycle of, of, of the injectable version is completed, the switching could, uh, could happen. There are certain things I think that have to be considered. One of them is the patient has to be compliant. So when we give the drug in the clinic, the injectable version, we are actually seeing uh, you know, that the patient is taking the injection and we are able to view them uh, you know, and confirm that they are taking it. When we are giving the drug orally, we have to rely on the patient. They are not gonna forget to take the drug. And that's important be, uh, to make sure that the activity is continued. The second thing is that the fact that you are giving an oral version of, of a chemotherapy or a hypomethylating agent does not make it uh, um, necessarily like, you know, uh, safer. So those drugs could have complications, which means that the patient has to be monitored the same way you are monitoring someone who's getting an intravenous version. So just because someone is getting an oral version doesn't mean that it becomes like a hypertension medication and you know they, they can be seen only uh, very infrequently. Depending on their blood counts, at the very least, I think the patient should get a blood count once a month, probably more frequently, if they are transfusion dependent and still early in the course of the treatment, they should be seen even once or twice a week and potentially get blood transfusions. Another consideration I think that's important to think about is the cost component because oral, um, oral drugs could, are covered generally under a different um, type of insurance. So ins uh, Medicare Part D, most MDS patients are older and they are under Medicare. So there could be significant cost sharing or copay considerations depending on whether you are using the oral version or the IV version. So that's something you really wanna kind of also um, make sure you have a good understanding with your physician before uh, such a switch is taken. 
Dr. Verma, anything to add? Uh, no, no, I think uh, Amir covered it very comprehensively. Great, thank you. This question comes from a patient who is currently using loose Patercept off label. They are a transfusion dependent MDS patient. They do not have the subtype of the ring sitter blast. They're on their fifth treatment, no improvement in the hemoglobin. They are having some pretty severe side effects. Mm -hmm. At what point does a patient consider stop taking loose powder sept? And a note is they've also failed Videza. So what are some other options for this patient to consider? Yes, no, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, you know, did you say five cycles so far? Yes. Okay. And, uh, you know, the one thing I would ask is, has, has the dose been increased uh, from the starting dose or not? If I presume the dose has been increased as recommended, so there are two dose levels. If uh, the patient is taking the highest dose level and has taken it at least you know, two to three times, meaning, you know, uh, I would say two to three cycles at the highest dose level, and there's still no response. And if there are, you know, as you mentioned, side effects that, that are being experienced, then unfortunately, uh, the chances that it will work uh, are not very high. Now, uh, if anemia is the only problem at, at this stage and it's a low intermediate risk uh, MDS, the blasts are not elevated, uh, you know, there are a few other approaches. Uh, one thing that a lot of uh, we try is uh, the erythropoietic stimulating agents, uh, EPO, darbopoietin, ARNS, you know, different names. And that uh, you know, the efficacy of that agent would depend on what the EPO level is. So, so usually patients before they start losperacep already have either failed these agents or their EPO levels are very high. So that's one thing I would make sure has been done. Uh, and then uh, if, if that's not, you know, an option, then the, the, you said the patient had already failed Vidaza. So, so that's another uh, um, you know, FDA approved drug that's been tried, then unfortunately, you know, we're left with things which are a little bit more um, experimental in the sense that there are some promising things that are being tried in clinical trials. Uh, these include some of the agents that Dr. Zaiden uh, showed in his presentation, the CD47 antibody, the APR drug, though both of them are being tried predominantly for high-risk MDS. The CD47 trial does have a low risk uh, arm. And then there are these other uh, trials that are going on in many different centers. And I think, you know, we, we are happy to um, check uh, if we have any trials for particular patients. Clinicaltrials.gov is another place where patients can check for clinical trials. There are some other TGF beta inhibitors uh, there are, uh, you know, agents that act on other bad pathways that block red cell formation. There's a lot of activity that's going on, but I think uh, in terms of FDA-approved agents, we unfortunately ha don't have that many. Um, Amir, any uh, further thoughts? Oh, yeah. yeah, I think you covered it quite well. I, I think the only addition I probably have is that um, there, there is some experience in uh, in using immunosuppressive therapy in, in some patients. So for a patient who is not a candidate for a clinical trial or who lives far or for whatever reason cannot do a clinical trial, which I always uh, encourage as, as an option, um, I think trying linalidomide, which is an oral immunomodulatory agent, it works usually in a, in a subset called deletion 5Q the best. But similar to Los Patters, uh, unfortunately, many of our patients don't have those uh, deletion 5Q or um, the ring sidroplast, and we don't have great options. So we often try these drugs outside of where they have been studied the most. Uh, so lenalidomide could be an option. Immunosuppressive treatment, which usually in, uh, includes a drug called uh, ATG, antithymocyte globulin, um, and this is and uh, in combination with another drug called uh, cyclosporin. Uh, 
So those are uh, things that could be tried, uh, but I do encourage the patient uh, to kind of uh, seek advice or you know, an, an, an expert opinion or someone who sees a lot of MDS uh, patients if they have not already. Um, but ultimately I think some, especially the older patients who are not candidates for bone marrow transplant, this can become a problem. And sometimes a patient will just have to rely on frequent transfusions along with um, drugs that lower the iron level to try to minimize uh, a chance of iron accumulation, what we call iron, iron chelator uh, therapy. Thank you. With either of the new drugs that um, have just been approved, whether it's the um, loose powder sept or the Encovi, when should patients after they start the treatment expect to see some type of response? Yeah, I can, I can go first. You know, with losperacept, uh, the drug is given every three weeks. Generally, the responses will take at least, you know, a month or two on an average. Uh, so at least two to three cycles or two to three doses before we expect to see a response. And, uh, you know, I would ask Amir about the, the oral hypomethylator. Yeah, along the same lines, like if, uh, most of the MDS drugs, uh, you know, require patients. Uh, basically, several months are often needed with the hypomethylating agents, whether they are the injectable form way, uh, format or the oral format, as well as linalidomide. All of these drugs can take three to four months and sometimes up to six months. So we generally don't uh, encourage the patients and their physicians not to stop the drug, except if there is uh, some significant toxicity that cannot be managed by interruptions or supportive measures, or if there's clear evidence of progression. Uh, if those are not present, I usually would continue at least three to four months and sometimes up to uh, six months. One of the common, um, I think, problems we see in the community uh, in, in my clinic where, where I see patients who have only received one or two cycles of, for example, azacitidine, and then the drug was stopped because this is how traditionally is done with chemotherapy for solid tumors. You give one or two cycles and there is no response. You switch to something else. This is not the case with MDS. The way these drugs work through epigenetic mechanisms, it can take some time. Uh, so generally, uh, the recommendation is to try at least for several months before the drug is stopped. Thank you. This question comes from a patient who has had three doses of the um, loose powder sept. They developed pulmonary embolisms in both lungs. They'd like to know, are there any statistics regarding the incidence of blood clots from using this drug? Yeah, I, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, the, the that that complication was not particularly noticed in the clinical trials that have been published. Uh, you know, the one one possibility is always that there are certain patients who have a terrific response. Their hemoglobin goes above ten, and it can cause uh, you know more tendency to clot. But you know, with three doses, I'm not sure you know that was the situation. So, so this this is a side effect that is unusual. Uh, we have not really seen. I have not personally seen a case and not read about this in in uh, literature. So it's a rare complication, unfortunately. Thank you. Our next question is: Are there any drugs that are helpful for someone who has a TP53 abnormality? So, yeah. yeah, so um, as, as, as probably many of the audience knows, these TP53 mutations are one of the significant uh, or the highest unmet needs in MDS because uh, they are generally associated with um, poor survival and high resistance to many of the standard therapies that we use. So we generally currently use still the same drugs, the hypomethylating agents, for example, if the patient has higher risk MDS. However, even with bone marrow transplant, uh, those patients generally don't do particularly well. Um, so there has been a lot of interest in trying several agents and the most recent studies have focused on two major uh, drugs. One is called APR246 uh, and this is an uh, injectable that basically works by uh, refolding the TP53. So what happens in some mutations with this TP53, which is an important cell regulator, uh, 
it becomes misfolded. And when a protein misfolds, it, it stops to function properly. So what this drug uh, does, it, it refolds it in a way that makes it functional again. So it doesn't necessarily work if you have a TP53 deletion, but if you have a mutation, uh, those patients are being studied uh, on, um, or were studied in a phase two trial that showed good responses. However, uh, the trial um, is still in follow-up. We still need to see longer follow-up and see how those patients did over time. And there is a phase three trial that has recently finished accruing of patients with MDS who have TP53 in which they received azacitidine with, the, with this agent, APR246, or azacitidine alone. So it's a randomized controlled trial. This study has finished accruing and we expect results sometime in, in next year. And I think it would be um, uh, uh, very helpful for us and for our patients if this drug was to show positive results. Another drug that's in somewhat earlier stage is drug called magrolimab, or uh, it's a drug that works on uh, CD47. So this CD47 is a protein that's present on many of the normal blood cells or the body cells, which are a way to tell the macrophages, which are the, uh, I, I tend to call them the backmans of, 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 the, of the body. So they tend to eat bacteria and bad cells. When they see the CD47, this protein on cells, they know it's a cell that is normal and it's not a bad cell. However, cancer does one thing in which it increases the expression of this CD47 so that it, it tricks the macrophages, the protective immune cells, to think that they are normal cells. And what does this antibody against CD47 do? Is it coats this protein so that the macrophages are activated. So it's in a form of immune checkpoint inhibition, works against this what we call don't eat me signal, the CD47. So early studies have shown that patients uh, with MDS uh, seem to respond to this drug in combination with azacitidine. But similar to the APR246 story, it's still uh, a small number of patients early in follow-up. So we still need longer, um, longer follow-up. And also our randomized phase three study has just been initiated with this, with this agent. In terms of the TB53 mutation and a signal emerged from the phase two data suggesting that patients with TB53 mutation seems to be particularly responsive to this uh, drug. It's still not clear what are the biological reasons why would that be the case. Um, but it's something I think that will require again, longer follow-up and uh, to kind of see more patients go on this agent to better understand. But I think there are several other options that are being studied. And I do think that we are looking at a brighter future for MDS patients in general over the next few years. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, Dr. I, would, I would just mention one, it's a great answer. You know, sure. uh, if, if you have a P53 mutation and, you know, if you're a younger patient, then transplant is always, you know, should be a consideration. Thank you. Dr. Verma did answer this question um, in the chat, but I just in case there is anyone else who would like the answer, um, Dr. Zayden had mentioned about iron overload. Um, at, what, at what number of ferritin is it suggested that iron chelation therapy be started and what are the therapies? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, there are a number of uh, different uh, clinical guidelines that use different cutoffs. So the, one of the more common numbers are a ferritin level of 2000 or 2500. There are guidelines who use a lower limit of around 1000. Other guidelines recommend uh, um, using it based on the number of the red blood cell uh, units that have been administered. So once you have crossed 20 units of uh, red blood cells, at that point, you can start using the drug. Uh, there are a number of agents that are available. Um, Deferacerox uh, or Xjade and Jadino is a new formulation of that. Is one commonly used because it's an oral agent. There was deferoxamine, which is an intravenous uh, or subcutaneous uh, infusion multiple days a week. So it's generally, we don't use it in MDS because it's very difficult to comply with. But there are a number of oral agents that are used in, in this uh, setting. However, they also, like any other drug, can come with some side effects. They can potentially affect the kidneys, and in rare situations, they can cause uh, GI bleeding or 
other um, complications. So I think it's an important discussion to have with the physician if your ferritin level is high or you are getting a lot of blood transfusions about the benefits and the risks that come with, with the use of those iron chelators. Thank you very much, Dr. Zaiden and Dr. Verma for sharing your time and your expertise with all of us uh, today. If you would like to watch this webinar again at a later time, it will be available on our website within two to three business days. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to send it to us at any time in three ways. You can send an email to help at aamds.org, call our helpline 800-747-2820, extension 2, or submit your question on our Facebook page. I would also like to remind everyone that this Saturday, we will be hosting our fall patient and family conference. It'll be another opportunity to hear um, sessions by uh, bone marrow failure experts and your opportunity to answer some more questions. You can find more information on our website, which is AA mds.org. Just look under the tab of education and you'll find the information there under the conference tab. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, thank you for joining us today, making us your resource of choice on information on bone marrow failure diseases. The AA MDSIF Medical Advisory Board and team are here to support you and your family as we have done for the past 36 years. This concludes today's program. Thank you, Dr. Zaiden and Dr. Verma. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.